Thank you for your interest in this West Virginia School of Preaching Victory Lectureship being done virtually this year. We certainly hope you enjoy these lectures on the Book of Romans, chapters 12 through 16. Hello and welcome to our lectureship. We invite you to sing along with the song that uh, will come immediately following this. We have the words and the music there for you to sing along. And after that, we'll be led in prayer by one of our students, Rod Goddard. I will call upon the Lord, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. Is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved so from my enemies. Be saved from my enemies. The Lord liveth. And blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. The Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. I will call upon the Lord, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. Who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved so from my enemies. And blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. The Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. I will call upon the Lord. I will call upon the Lord. Let us pray. Our Father and God in heaven, we are truly grateful for another moment that we get to spend uh, studying your word. Father, we pray that this study will be beneficial to us, that it will glorify your name in our hearts and in the way that we live our lives. Father, please forgive us of our sins, and we pray for the speaker of this hour. Please help him to be able to recall the things that he has prepared to say to us from your word. Father, we thank you for your word. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. It's my privilege to introduce to you the speaker of this hour, a great friend, wonderful gospel preacher, Brother J.D. Conley. J.D. is a third-generation gospel preacher, uh, majored in Bible at Freed Hardeman, went on to the Brown Trail School and has uh, been the preacher at Spencer and then Elkins and then for the last 17 years at the Harmer Hill Congregation in Marietta, Ohio. J.D. has been a great friend to our school. In fact, one of his sons is a graduate of our school, now preaching in New Philly, Ohio. He has been married to the former Denise Cooper for 41 years. We have the greatest appreciation for Brother Conley. I ask you to give him your attention at this time. As always, it is a distinct honor to speak on this series of lectures, and I want to thank the elders of this good church, the lectureship committee, and Andy for the invitation to speak, and for the topic assigned to me, which is the restraint from judging a brother, taken from Romans, the 14th chapter, verses 9 through 12. We know that a profuse amount of false teaching has been taught from Paul's letter to the saints at Rome. And some of this erroneous teaching has been done deliberately and some due to ignorance. After all, the epistle is one of intellectual depth. Its profundity scorns light reading. Nonetheless, when it comes to the matter of eternal salvation, it does not require a lot of cerebral activity nor a heavy investment of gray matter to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. In fact, the closing chapters deal with practical matters more than esoteric ones. And yet perhaps more false teaching has been done from Romans chapter 14 than any other chapter in the book. This is bad enough. But the dogma being called from its sacred leaves is not limited to the denominations, but are also being touted by some of our own brethren. 
And once again, some of it is done deliberately to condone a sinful practice, and some simply do not understand what this chapter is teaching. Concerning the latter, their heart may be right, but it's darkened to the torch of truth. Ignorance is a type of weakness, but not all weakness is tied to ignorance. Neither is all weakness tethered to a lack of faith, nor are the weak always wrong and the strong always right. And this brings us to the crux of what Paul discusses in this chapter. Therefore, let us begin with a reputable review. If an understanding of this chapter is going to be achieved, it is crucial to remember that Paul is talking about subjects that are matters of opinion and not matters of faith. A matter of faith pertains to doctrinal mandates. It concerns that which God has either commanded or forbidden. Whereas a matter of opinion concerns that which God has neither commanded nor forbidden. Regarding matters of opinion, the list is endless, whereas the matters of faith are confined within bold perimeters. For example, consider the difference between the two. Whether to serve the fruit of the vine in one cup or multiple cups would be a matter of opinion, but it would not include whether to have the Lord's Supper on any other day of the week. Whether to have Bible class before or after the worship service is a matter of opinion. What time on Sunday to have the worship service is a matter of opinion, but not whether to have a worship service. Now, the pandemic prevented saints from assembling. The choice to assemble was denied us, but otherwise we would have assembled. I'm delivering this lecture to an empty room. You're watching it weeks later, all because of the limits the COVID outbreak has placed upon us. And I'm happy to say that many congregations have resumed their full slate of services and classes. How many services is a matter of opinion within each autonomous congregation. But for a congregation to cancel all services into perpetuity would be wrong. Whether to build or rent a building, or meet in someone's house, or even outdoors, or in the parking lot, in our cars, as many did for a while, is optional. We have great liberty in this regard. But if we can meet, we should meet. Let us fervently pray this freedom will not ever be taken away. Where we assemble for worship is a matter of opinion, but assembling for worship is a matter of faith. This chapter deals with converts who had a conscience against eating meats sacrificed to idols. Paul clearly argues this should not be a matter of faith, but should be kept in the realm of individual opinion. He instructs a brother to have respect for the mental reservations of those who felt uneasy about the eating of such meats. He says in verse 1, Him that is weak in the faith receive you, but not to doubtful disputations. Paul teaches to welcome the weak brother, but don't quarrel with him over his personal opinion about not eating meats. And so this brings us to my assignment which is the restraint from judging a brother. And this is a theme that flows throughout the chapter and is not limited to my text, verses 9 through 12. In verses 2 through 6, Paul sheds light on why strong, seasoned Christians should exercise restraint on passing judgment on babes in Christ. But also included in that number and perhaps especially in that number, are those who for one reason or another have a personal hang-up 
about things being wrong that actually are not wrong. Bear in mind that the Roman church was composed of both converted Jews and converted pagans, which was potentially a volatile mix. No two groups could have been more different. But now they're all one in Christ Jesus, Galatians chapter 3 and verse 28. But in order to stay one, matters of opinion had to be left alone and unchallenged. The strong were going to have to be strong enough to leave the weak alone. The weak, on the other hand, were going to need to make an effort to grow stronger. Thus some hard work was to be exerted by both parties in order for peace and unity to reign in the church. Again, this was going to be a tall order, but a necessary one due to the fact that the Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians had experienced vastly different upbringings. It appears that the former pagans had given up the eating of meat altogether because much of what was being sold in the marketplace had been sacrificed to idols. And consequently, they only ate vegetables. Even though Paul had forbade the Corinthians to eat meat in a pagan temple in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, he said they could eat whatever was sold at the market without asking questions. But some in Rome had deep-seated conscientious objections against eating meat at all. And this, of course, was in the realm of opinion and liberty. In verses 3 and 4, Paul admonishes the strong brother not to despise the weaker brother. The American Standard Version of 1901 renders it set at naught. This is a prohibition against making light of or treating with contempt the weaker brother's conviction against eating meat. In verse 4, Paul asks, Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? Meaning that even a strong Christian has no right to pass judgment and hand down condemnation when the matter in question is one of indifference. Paul continues in verse 5, One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. A lot of Christian Jews, having grown up keeping the Sabbath day and other Jewish holidays, days in which all work ceased, had lingering doubts about working on those particular days. At this point in their Christianity, they did not fully understand their liberty in Christ. I've known members of the church who grew up thinking it was wrong to mow the lawn on Sunday, and yet there's nothing wrong in doing so. Those who think so need to more fully understand the liberty of the gospel and must not bind their opinion on others. Furthermore, Paul states that in matters of opinion, we must be fully convinced in our own minds that what we do is right. He says at the end of verse 5, let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He then ends the chapter saying, for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Verse 23, anyone who does what he believes is wrong or who does what he believes might be wrong sins. There are brethren who think it is wrong to eat in the church building. If they do so, they violate their own conscience. We must not violate our own conscience, even if what we do is permitted and is not wrong in and of itself, if we go ahead and do it, thereby breaching our conscience, that is what is wrong. To summarize verses 6 through 8, sincerity to please the Lord in whatever we do or choose not to do is put in the spotlight. As Christians, we seek to please the Lord 
not ourselves. Let us now focus our attention on a rendering of the word restraint. Now, we all know what is meant by the term restraint, so I don't need to define it. That is not what I mean when I say render. Instead, what I want to do is show that is render an explanation of how restraint is to be used in judging a brother. It's important to understand that the restraint we are to use in judging a brother, that is a complete holding back, must not be used in every scenario. Once again, it all depends upon the nature of the situation. In matters of opinion and indifference, restraint is required and must be held in check. Whereas in doctrinal matters, that is matters of faith, restraint, though it should be carefully used, must be used. Should we restrain from judging a brother when it comes to indifferent matters? Absolutely. It must not ever be done. Should we restrain from judging a brother in doctrinal matters? No. Our judgment must be given as it aligns with God's teaching on judging, which are found in many passages, two of which are Matthew chapter 7 and John chapter 7. So let us not buy into this common fallacy that all judging is wrong because some judging is right, some judging is needed, and some judging is necessarily required on our part as Christians. Rather, it is certain kinds of judging that are sinful. What kinds? Hypocritical judging, self-righteous judging, prejudging. If there's one verse in the Bible that every reprobate can quote, it's Matthew chapter 7 and verse 1, Judge not, that you be not judged. When people use that to hammer us, they are oblivious to the fact that they are judging us by saying, Judge not. The moment these two words leave their mouth, they are guilty of what they are accusing us of doing. They are judging that we are judging. People misuse Matthew chapter 7 and verse 1. Obviously, they've never read the next five verses, which would enlighten them on the biblical differences in how to judge and how not to judge. In verses 2 through 5, Jesus is clearly renouncing hypocritical judging, and he does so with the humorous beam and moat illustration. Today, we'd equate this to a log and a speck of sawdust. What a picture the Lord draws. Jesus describes a brother who has a log protruding from his own eye while he is trying to extract a speck of sawdust from his brother's eye. How utterly hypocritical. This is a perfect example of one brother not exercising restraint from judging another brother. The brother with the speck-inflicted eye was in a better position to judge the brother with the log jutting out of his eye. Yes, moats need to be removed, but not by a brother who is blinded by beams in their own eyes. Jesus continues in verse 6, talking about dogs and pigs. Make no mistake, he is talking about the two-legged kind, not the ones with curly tails and tails that wag. This language proves that all judging is not wrong. In order to obey this verse, do we not have to judge who is a dog and who is a pig? Sure. Indeed, there are different kinds of judging. Some judging is forbidden and some judging is required. May we also use cautious restraint in any temptation to judge a brother on mere appearance. 
Jesus commands, judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. John chapter 7 and verse 24. We are not to misjudge and make improper conclusions just on the way things look. We've all heard the expression, appearances can be deceiving. But if we are fair-minded people, we ought to admit that at times appearances can be explained. My grandfather, a gospel preacher for over 60 years, told the story about a member of the church who was seen going into a bar. And the rumors began to swirl. The appearance was deceiving, but the appearance was soon explained. You see, the brother was a plumber, and he was going there to fix a leak in the restroom. But the rumors caused him a lot of heartache and sleepless nights. But the point that needs to be stressed is that Jesus nowhere condemns all judging across the board. Far from it. Instead, he requires proper judging. He condemns improper judging. Let's now turn our attention to the text and examine a reason for the resurrection in verse 9. For to this end Christ both died and arose and revived that he might be Lord both of the dead and living. The resurrection of our Lord is the great leveler of brethren, both the strong and the weak. Both groups have living and dying in common, whether in life or in death. Both the strong and the weak Christian belong to the Lord. Jesus never abandons either one throughout life or at the point of death. This is why Christ died. He arose and revived and exited that rock vault so he could be the Lord of the living and the rescuer of the dead. Therefore, how could the weak judge their strong brethren, and condemn, condemn them as digressive apostates? And how could the strong set at naught their weak brethren? We belong to Christ. He is the judge, not us. In verse 12, Paul underscores this truth by quoting from Isaiah. So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Judging a brother wrongfully is a grave matter in which we should never be engaged. May we exercise restraint from doing so at all times, even when it is required of us. In such instances, may we render our judgment in the spirit of love and gentleness, considering thyself lest thou also be tempted, Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1. Consider the next, a Redeemer's reproof, the first part of verse 10. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set at naught thy brother? Why are people prone to be critical of one another? Why do people relish running others down? Why is the practice of downputting so ingrained in the psyche of so many people today? Some seem to have a pathological bent in verbally abusing others and engaging in character assassination. I have no answer other than by tearing others down, some feel lifted up. Some seem to truly enjoy and derive pleasure from doing these hateful things. But when brethren act like this toward one another, it's unconscionable. What a venal and heinous practice. By posing these pointed questions, Jesus, our Redeemer, is reproving this despicable brotherhood habit. He is implying, why do you do these things? What good reason do you have to support it? Any answer that one might offer is feeble 
and indefensible. It is inexcusable to quote F.F. F. Bruce. There is no sign to which Christians, especially keen Christians, are more prone than that of criticizing others. His observation is astute. He is saying by using the word keen, K-E-E-N, that strong Christians are the ones who are more apt to criticize than any other, which makes sense because the strong Christian knows more, he prays more, is more discerning, more in tune with what is required in living a life of purity and devotion. So when the strong Christian looks around and he sees what other Christians are doing or not doing, their inclination is perhaps to be too quick with criticism, which in turn weakens him or her in God's sight. And without realizing it, their unjust criticism has reduced their strength, has made them weak. Jesus is letting us know there is no sense in that. Whenever the Lord inquires not once, but twice, why, regarding our actions, it should be paused for serious contemplation and immediate repentance. The habit, for some a hobby, of being critical of our brothers and sisters in Christ should come to an abrupt halt. Because as we see next, there will be a reckoning Required, For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. The mere thought of standing at the judgment bar of Christ in the august presence of his glory ought to be reason enough to never unjustly judge a fellow child of his. To do so only heaps harm upon ourselves. All of us are accountable to God for our actions. Brother Lester Camp has said, the difficulties between strong and weak brethren can be resolved when both view the certainty of judgment and realize their individual accountability before the judge of the quick and the dead. Imagine the abject fear of standing before our great judge, knowing we are guilty of this sin, and nothing at that point can be done. How many strong Christians will be lost because they condemned their weak brother in a matter of indifference? With regards to this, may each one of us ponder long and hard and make the needed correction. In verse 11, we have a ready retort. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. Every means every. And because Jesus said so, lends it supreme gravitas. Every atheist, every agnostic, every skeptic, every antitheist, every religiously ambivalent person, and every child of God, weak or strong, shall genuflect before the great I Am. This full-throated confession will be a ready retort, springing from the mouth of both believer and unbeliever. For the believer, this confession will come forth from a heart of praise, coupled with eyes that finally find their focus on their Redeemer. But for the unbeliever, this ready retort of the divine will be met with dread and panic-filled eyes. This universal bowing and disclosure of deity is a certainty which cannot be denied because the Lord prefaced both with, As I live, saith the Lord. Not only will this stupendous event transpire, the moment it does, we shall find ourselves, as Barclay wrote, standing before the judgment seat of God in the naked loneliness 
of our own souls at the twinkling of an eye, may we be prepared to make the ready retort of our Redeemer. Verse 12 depicts a remarkable reaction. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Again, the word every is spirit employed. Every person who has ever lived will answer for his character and conduct. In this life, there are many who shun personal accountability and do not want to be held responsible for their actions. Some are adept at dodging accountability, but all such tactics and maneuverings will prove futile at the judgment. Not only will each person crease the knee and confess Christ, Barnes worded it this way, as we shall be called to so fearful an account with God, we should not be engaged in condemning our brethren. Most people refuse to remark on their foibles and shortcomings, much less their own sins, but on the last day, they will be compelled to remark on not just a portion of their lives, but their lives in total. What will take place on that august and epic occasion will be remarkable in more ways than one. Therefore, let us not have our remarks tainted by harsh and unrestrained judgment of our brethren. Judgments are required in life. Thousands are made every day without us even realizing it. Even judging brethren is necessary in order to determine if they are weak or strong. It is impossible to quash judging, nor should we try. As we have seen, judging is required in living the Christian life. How can we beware of false prophets which come in sheep's clothing apart from judging? We can't. The same is true with the command to beware of dogs, beware of evil workers. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 2. Once again, a judgment must be made. How can we mark them which cause divisions? Romans chapter 16 and verse 17. Without making a judgment. It simply cannot be done. Thus judging is required of God's children. Obedience is demands it. And nevertheless, attached to proper judging is the understanding of and the need for restraint. To aid us in this matter, Paul says, speaking of love, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 7. If we would think the best of others, it would go a long way in holding our judgments in check. Along this line, Peter wrote, Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren. Be pitiful. Be courteous. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 8. Just think of the peace and the unity and the happiness that would prevail across our great brotherhood if just one of these verses were obeyed or if the words of our text were taken to heart. Such compliance would make a lesson of this type completely unnecessary. May we strive more than ever to make this our goal. We thank the speaker of this hour for providing us that lesson. We thank you for your interest in the Word of God. If you'd like to study the Bible more or learn more about us, please contact us. We'd love to hear from you.
blessed peace of heaven's land is your body and your soul. You were made in the image. You were made in the image. You were made in the image of God. In the image of God.